I'm Cody Looking Horse, and I'm seven years old, <laughs> and I love you, Grandma, and now we're going to sing for you. Our collective minds and hearts hereby declare the following. Women give life. Violence against indigenous women must cease. Women are the mothers of our nations, and their authority must be recognized within and outside indigenous nations. Mothers of Our Nations. The Elder Summit was the culmination of really what I call reimagining ourselves. Not asking permission if it's okay to do this, uh, not asking for government involvement, just doing it. And just getting women to see that they can be leaders. And I involved the youth a lot because I wanted the youth to see that there are ways, even though they'll be challenging and difficult, there are ways to resolve these issues. Through the Iroquois culture, this is a matrilineal society, and it's the woman that takes care, and the men come to the women for their count, like to, to get, I guess, their advice. Um, and that's been kind of pushed aside through the years, and it's time that the women, I guess the women are finally taking a stand and taking their positions where they should be. The understanding I have as a clan mother is that she has a big family, and her family is her own immediate family first, her sons and daughters, her grandchildren, and it goes beyond to the clan system. And that becomes her family also when she becomes a clan mother. And her duties are to always be neutral, to never ever take sides, and to always try and in a kind way to settle in a way that both sides of the fence, so to speak, is in agreement with what was being talked about. Since I've been coming here, then um, I, I kind of understand more, you know, because I wanted to hear all of the other people's uh, problems, and hopefully some of, some of them can solve it from gathering like this. The UNP ride has been something they've been doing for years. I heard that they had dreams and prophecies that it was supposed to end here. That's why they came in this direction. And to me, it represents two different things. One is um, it's a platform for our voices to be heard. That's where, where the unity comes in. So everybody can collect their ideas and deal with their issues and their struggles and put it down on paper and take it to the United Nations. Through a process of the community getting together and having this very open-ended conversation about the state that our people are in um, due to colonialism, that the women felt something had to shift spiritually with our people and that we needed our traditional knowledge. We needed that guidance. There's a lot of spiritual elders here, people that have brought medicine bundles, um, their staffs that are um, a spiritual part of them. And I think that's good medicine that they're bringing into the community. It's all about healing, all the pain that our people have gone through. My interest is with the people coming together, knowing that they don't have the money to do it, that they're going to sacrifice time at home, time with families, and just be together and do it for whatever they feel 
um, is important. As soon as I heard about the Elder Summit and what was going on, I just ha I had to be involved somehow. I had to help somehow. I didn't care if it was volunteer work or anything. I just wanted to help improve our situation. I dream a lot and my dreams help me. And the, the last two nights before the Unity arrived, arrived here, I had a dream that I was with them. I was traveling with them. And I've been told that your spirit is traveling when you're dreaming. And so I think that I was with them. And then when they got here, it was um, really overwhelming for me to see them coming over that bridge because I felt the ancestors with them. It wasn't just them. You can't think clearly and you can't see clearly and you can't speak clearly and think about the future and think about a better future unless you go through what our people call condolence, but what the Lakotas call wiping the tears. All indigenous societies have grieving rituals and rites and to acknowledge that we've suffered enormous losses. I come from a family of six at Tainanega, and um, I'm the eldest of, our, of that nuclear family. And uh, my mother passed away in childbirth when she was 23 years old. She, uh, she left behind uh, six of us, one who, who died as, a, as an infant from juvenile diabetes. Mm -hmm. And the five of us uh, who are left, um, my father was left uh, with um, a three-week-old, a 13-month-old, 26 month old and a four and a five year old and um, he tried his mother had raised uh, 10 children and had participated with 72 grandchildren and 36 great-grandchildren and really saw taking us on as, as no big issue but you know this is in the early 60s when the children's aid and the 60s scoop happened and they didn't believe that older people could care for kids and we eventually got taken and uh, put in the in the children's aid system in foster homes part of my recovery was to recognize and accept that the intention whether people will agree and articulate it or not doesn't matter, but the intention of, of government policy was the eradication of us as a people, that we simply weren't going to be around. And, you know, through legislative acts, uh, through, uh, through policing, through the military, through all kinds of ways, they've really driven our own image of ourselves underground. Not just dots, not so that we had to do our ceremonies at night, but there's been this overall address uh, in curriculum, not just even in residential schools, in ways that we're not supposed to be here. And I came to ask for the prayers of the elders and the medicine men and the clan mothers for your prayers <laughs> because our sisters are losing hope. <laughs> we are losing ground every day that we fight and we stand alone. I just ask for your prayers. <laughs> They're our future. And the expectation is that the woman will do and can do everything, you know, and, and that's how I grew up. My mother did it. My grandmother did it. You know, my grandmother had nine, ten children. My mother had four children. And they were all single moms, you know, and then feeling like such a failure because I couldn't raise three children mm, by myself. Last year, when I had first decided to get clean last year, um, and I had had my three children by then, I didn't feel like I had um, the support that I needed. I do not trust a single 
person in this world, including myself. I've had lots of time and I've had some really, really, really strong women kind of helping me along on this kind of, um, this last piece to help me kind of understand some of that stuff about where I need to go and stuff. When, when I was in treatment last year, um, we had to do uh, a family tree and we had to put like some of the issues um, faced by some of our families. When I looked at it and I saw it, I was, I mean, I lost it. I mean, I just, I just lost, I was like, I was crying and I was, um, I felt completely defeated and beaten down. And, and I, I couldn't stop crying. I could not stop crying to actually look at it like that, to see um, what's been done to my family, you know, and stuff. And although I didn't go to residential school, my brother and my sisters both went, and uh, to, to look at it, you know, and to understand where it comes from. And when I talked to a lady, this extremely wonderful lady um, who sat there and, and listened to me cry and comforted me and stuff, one of the things that I was explaining to her is I said, when I see it like that, I understand where it's coming from. I said, who am I supposed to be angry with? I have no place to place it. You know, like, okay, the abuse has happened, but I can't be angry with that person because they were abused. And I can't be, you know, what am I supposed to do? Go, you know, am I going to go knock on government's door and say, <laughs> excuse me, <laughs> I'm angry. I am angry. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Our women are targeted in many communities and especially urban communities and we're not just talking about domestic violence we're also talking what's called racialized violence where we're being targeted as women because we're we're First Nations, Métis, or Inuit. And that's the issue that NWAC, or the Native Women's Association of Canada, is striving to address. So we know there's a lot of information that's out there. So the first thing we thought would be important in this campaign is we wanted to see the numbers that are out there. So we are going to develop a hotline, a national registry where families can call in and uh, register a family member that's missing. So we estimate that over the last 30 years, there are more than 500 Aboriginal women that are either uh, unsolved murders or they're missing and ha their families have no idea where they are. <laughs> These two ladies, I admire them. I admire their courage. Um, they lost their daughter. They lost their mother. They lost a friend. Today, Sheena is a daughter to, to Shelly Joseph, and Eileen's the mother to Shelly. And both ladies are here and, and, and have been sharing their story of their loss. You know, so I'm really proud to be introducing them because I admire, like I said, I admire their courage to coming and sharing their story. And it's a much needed story that needs to be told. She was a loving person. She, um, she's the one that taught her brothers how to ice skate and play hockey. And she played hockey herself and she played ball. And um, they both played hockey and it was because, you know, she taught him to skate. Her journey was um, one of meeting all the wrong kind of people. I don't think she ever really knew she was abused because she stood up and uh, fought back and um, took it. She just... I don't think she ever felt abused. The night she died, I talked to her at one o'clock. Um, she died at three. Mm -hmm. And uh, one thing she said was, um, uh, um, I'll, you know, I'm gonna get help one of these days, you know. I'll, I'll, I know what you want, Mama, I'll, I'll get help. She says, and one of these days I'm gonna surprise you and I'll come home. Because mm -hmm. we had asked her to come home that night. You know, come home, I'll come and get you. And she says, oh. well, the next day was her um, youngest daughter's birthday. She was going to turn 16. So she would have come home for that. And uh, we didn't hear from her. And then at 1 o'clock, the police 
from Hamilton and our Six Nations police came in the driveway and uh, that's how we found out that um, she'd been stabbed. I've been dealing with it okay, talking about it helps. For me it's if I can help someone, just one person, that's what I'm here to do. I think that young women like Sheena who speak out about their mothers are heroes and will, will be known as heroes in history of women who broke the silence of violence and continued oppression. The one that affected most was my older brother though. I don't think he could, he couldn't get over her dying, being murdered. Almost a year later, he committed suicide. So things like this have, that people don't realize is that there's a huge impact that goes beyond just the victim. That the family is left with vulnerable. Um, women are standing up and saying, you know, that's enough. Families are saying that's enough. And and so when it comes to that, that violence that's occurring specific to our women, you know, it, it comes from that racism. It comes from um, our women being targeted because she's devalued. In medieval Europe, uh, 2,500 years ago, uh, they had created a law which said that if a woman spoke back against her husband, that he had a right by law to take a brick and smash her mouth. So when you go back in history and try to trace those kinds of things that's happening, uh, and you will follow it through, and then of course Columbus came and um, he probably had those values with him. And as, as it came across the land and the people lost uh, control over their own lives, uh, they started to imitate those other behaviors. And um, so here we are in 2006. Uh, uh, most often times uh, our men are uh, imitating somebody else's culture. Uh, to do what they do against women. Like just take for example, you know, Aboriginal women are 3% of the whole uh, population. Um, so the Picton situation in uh, the downtown east side of Vancouver, there's 70 documented women who are missing. They say that at least a third of those women are Aboriginal women. So that's 33% or more, at least. We don't know that for sure, but that's what we're, we're looking into now. Then there's the Highway of Tears in Northern BC. There's nine documented. There's eight out of nine of those women are, are young Aboriginal women, girls. You know, between 18 and, or 16 and 22. And that's only in one province. So this is occurring in all across the country and it's occurring across the world. You know, murder is violent. We, we know that. But the way that some of these women are being mutilated, bodies cut up, their body parts are thrown around like they're... There's no humanity. To live in this society and to try to come to terms with what that means, like that's a, that's a huge picture that's sending out to the rest of society that says it's okay to do that to a native woman. It's okay because nobody gives a shit about her anyway. And nobody's gonna look for her, nobody's gonna do anything. Um, she's just a native woman or she's just a hooker or she's just a drug addict. 
She needs help beyond the quitting of her drugs. She needs a love stronger than the drug. Without it, she will die spiritually, mentally, and emotionally, and physically. And each time, it will be in a basement or a dark corner, unless she learns to surrender first. When she surrenders, she will begin to see that just one more doesn't exist. She will be frightened as she begins to understand that just one more is a figment of her imagination. Everything she has ever thought to be true will be a lie. Everything she has ever believed will be slander. She will begin to see that her best friend for so long has been cheating and stealing from her. She will begin to see that life is hard and she will think about using every single day. She will want to escape more than she has ever wanted to because she is grieving the death of her lies. As she grieves, she will not understand what she needs to live life and her days will be filled with the universe's paradox. In the beginning, she will need more love and support than ever, yet she will resent it. She will be clean, yet she will feel dirty. She needs to express, yet she will chatter aimlessly. She needs unconditional love, yet she will put a million conditions on everyone around her. She needs time, yet she will count the days, hours, minutes, and seconds. She needs a new way of life, yet she will find comfort in old behaviors. She needs to surrender, yet she will start the war again. She needs serenity, yet she will create chaos. She needs understanding, yet she will judge. She needs hope, yet she will doubt. She needs people, yet she will isolate. She needs trust, yet she will manipulate. She needs to feel, yet she will numb herself. She needs self-esteem, yet she will beat herself to a pulp. And above all, she needs gratitude, yet she will be filled with self-pity. Her journey back will be difficult, and she may slip, but she cannot think about that because she doesn't know yet that all she really needs is faith. And to get there, she needs just one clean day. The women's issues alone um, could crush you if you didn't have some idea of what the solutions are going to be. And I fundamentally believe that our elders, our older people, our knowledgeable people, our traditional knowledge, that what was fragmented through colonialism has to begin coming back together again. And that there are answers. What I think we really need in this world today is a lot more role models so that the youth can actually see you know what being a good role model is that we have parts to play we have to watch our conduct we can't make rules for others stating you can't do this and then having them see us doing it i knew enough about <coughs> indigenous uh, cultures to know that you know women really did have a place of esteem in our in our societies and so what what's happened and um, <coughs> so that led me into further research into starting to look at um, you know, a number of different Indigenous nations, the, the position of women in their societies, and from their understanding that our women really did have uh, authority, uh, voice, power, recognition, esteem. The men were supposed to take the advice of the women, and that's what was brought to council. She chooses a chief in the way he is conducts himself, the way he speaks, the way he treats his own people, and how he is trying so hard to always keep things together. And yes, the council, the, the council of men were the ones to make that final decision when they did come together as a, as a council. But that whole process before that of the clan system, when their clan mothers meeting with your clan and that that's what's missing now. Just recently, uh, we were at the First Minister's meeting in Kelowna. One of the very first things that I said at the meeting is that I'm one woman at this table, one voice. And I looked around the room and the rest of you are men. I said, so there's a huge responsibility that I have here to represent Aboriginal women across the country. And I wasn't afraid. In this dream, um, I was sitting at, at this table and, and reminded of that strength that I had. And it wasn't just me, it was, you know, all of those spirits of those women who were always helping me. So they were showing me that and then they showed me the council of our chiefs. And, and shown that 
the, the thinking of our men are the same as the thinking of those men. And that we all as women have to have that voice back, that strength back, to be able to tell these men that this is, this is what it was supposed to be. That the women came with the voices of the people and the men respected that and just did it with no question. And now there's question. There's question and there's doubt. There's uh, no trust. What does it really mean to be a mother in a lot of these different nations? What kind of authority and voice does that carry? You know, what does it mean to, where is the women's place in the political system? How are women so instrumental in the economy, in the traditional economies? How did women ha um, have control of their own sexuality? The woman is the first environment. The womb is the first environment. And uh, I began to realize that no matter what indigenous people I spoke with, they, we, they all had some form of this teaching. I think the generations before us took so much more care because they didn't take their reproduction for granted. And in fact, um, miscarriage rates in this society are as high as half of all pregnancies. Um, I'm amazed that as many children are born what you might call whole, meaning that they have all their faculties, all of their senses, all of their capacities, everything that they need to develop in this world to be functional human beings. That can't be taken for granted. And it is so related to how a people relates to the earth, to the land, to the world around them, that you can almost use that as a measure of how healthy your, your future will be. They say that a long time ago, when the woman got married, she brought that man into her home. And all I could think was at that time, what man in his right mind would ever abuse a woman when she has her family right close to her? Her aunt, her sisters, her grandmother, or even great-grandmother if they're lucky enough. It's like, where, where, where would the violence be? I think it would be taken care of with the help of those other women. What do we mean when we say life is sacred? And how do we live that through what we do every day? Um, what do we mean when we say, you know, children and elders first in our communities? Um, what do we mean when we say, you know, women are the heart of the community? All of those things that we still talk about, a lot of times they're, they're really just platitudes because if we don't live them and if we don't really consider what that means in our day-to-day -day lives. And it's almost like going through that whole process of the great law again, um, where we're at right now, where there's violence, where women aren't safe, um, where we're hurting each other, where there's disrespect for each other. Somebody has to come forward and say that's enough. What we're told with those prophecies is, is that, that we don't take that responsibility, then we'll have nothing. But I don't want that to happen. I don't think any of us want that to happen. These indigenous teachings are not there just to make us ooh and ah and think, isn't that pretty? They're there for our very survival. And the relationship to the land is a key and you would have to be able to key into that aspect of being an Ongwahua woman to really appreciate the depth of that consciousness. It's not just psychological, it's also spiritual and a physical manifestation of authority and power and control and a voice and of sovereignty. For the pain that you've been through But now that I'm older and I am wiser I'm gonna take good care of you I'm so sorry for the times That I did not show respect And I allowed myself and others To put our problems upon your back 
After the Haudenosaunee negotiators were promised by the OPP they would not raid the peaceful encampment at Douglas Creek on April 20, 2006, they broke that promise. They raided women, children, elders, and youth at 3 in the morning with pepper spray, tasers, and brute force. Snipers surrounded the camp. I'm here upholding the law. We're here upholding the Gairalagoa. Our responsibilities with respect to that, um, defending our land and our rights. And um, we've been here for whatever, 50 something days. What's today? Wednesday? <coughs> Thursday. 52 days. Janie, has, has this not been an, a, an initiative really driven by yourself and women to, to take this action to, to reclaim this area? Mm -hmm. Could you tell me like what motivated you? What moved you to do that? My family's been through a lot of trauma, experienced a whole lot of trauma just right within the last three years. And um, I heard this news broadcast one day and they explained the places to grow law. And what that law entailed was putting four million families in the Golden Horseshoe area within the next 20 years. 5,000 5, families in this immediate area alone. Mm -hmm. And you take a look at our community, you know, and um, our children are in dire straits. And as a mother, as an auntie, as a cousin, I wasn't going to take any more risks with my kids. You know, I don't know what those 5,000 families will be bringing in. Any issues they may, oh, my children may have to face or deal with. And it was out of um, my concern for them and my grandchildren that I just couldn't take it anymore. I didn't want to take any risks. So the Doug Douglas Estates, I was in, in Longhouse the day that you and Don and some others asked the Confederacy chiefs for support. Could you tell me why did you do that? Why did you go to the Confederacy and ask for their support? We wanted to do this um, as a community united. Um, there's power in numbers and Monty. we realized Monty. the strength that we would have if everybody would get involved and work together to do this. And it's evident today, you know, that's what it takes you know, to accomplish anything is unity. I heard you were roughed up. A little bit. Could you tell me a little bit about what you experienced at the hands of the police? Sure. I, uh, when we were moving the police out of this front area here, I went back. I noticed there was about 20 officers at the back. So I went back to tell them that, you know, the police are moving out now, that you guys can go. And uh, the woman officer said that um, I was in violation of a court injunction and that if I didn't leave the premises, I'd be arrested. So I told her that she was in violation of the supreme law of the land, Argana Lagoa, as well as international laws, and that she should leave. And at that point, she told me that um, that if I didn't leave, I was going to be placed under arrest. And I don't remember what I said to her. I might have used profanity. I don't remember, but um, she said, that's it, ma'am, you're under arrest. And she grabbed hold of me and tried to take me down, but she couldn't. And then there was about four or five other officers that came to her assistance. And, and I, um, you know, I resisted as much as I could. I blocked them and it took them a while to get me down. But when they got me on the ground and while I was on the way down, I start hollering and people had heard. So they start coming to the back there and uh, they start kneeing me. I was on the ground, they start kneeing me. I was told later that they were shooting the tasers at me, but because I had a coat on, I didn't feel or get hit or anything like that. And, uh, Do you have any visible bruising? I had a bump. I mean, when the ambulance came in a while ago, they, um, they, they looked at it and I had a big bump on my leg and they gave me an ice pack and stuff like that. It's sore, but, I, I, um, but I'm okay. They pepper sprayed me and him and another man for no reason at all. And I, I looked at the cop before he even did it and I told him, you have no reason to do it, put it away. And he just started spraying. And I got burnt, my hands, my face were all red. And then um, there was uh, about five cops on an old man. They had their knees in his head and his back and everything and they were pushing him down and I pulled one of the cops off of him and the cop turned around, he pushed me and he knocked me down. With what I saw and what I experienced personally with the police over there, uh, it's, it's pretty one-sided as far as the media goes. N none of that was put out to the media. And that really disturbs me because I was there. I experienced it firsthand. So what's your next step now? What, what, what have the women, have the women gathered and said, you know, okay, they attacked us at night, 
you know, they did it in a dishonorable way, they used brute force. What, what do you want us to do? What do you want all of us to do? What's, what's the strategy here that, that you feel would be serve your interests or the interest of the Haudenosaunee? We don't have, we don't have any access to you. Well, what we've been asking for from the beginning, we need to be dealt with on a nation-to-nation -nation basis. Um, Canada has uh, had this, uh, I, I don't know what the word is, facade going on since its establishment that it's a country. It's not a country. It's an it's a arm, like a, it's, a, it's an arm of the crown. And the crown has obligations to the Haudenosaunee people through treaties. And we've been asking since day one for international mediation to come in because it's not going to be resolved as long as Canada just refuses to A, recognize the Haudenosaunee people, but B, to think that they're going to be able to sit at a table when our laws, like I said, the Grand Law Go is a supreme law of the land. It's above the crown's laws. It's been here a lot longer. Theirs was established by ours. And uh, we need that international mediation. But I'm just hoping and hoping that they'll understand we want it back. We don't want it. money. I don't think so. And we don't want trouble because Caledonia, people think that's all we're here for is trouble. And they're the ones making all the trouble, you know. So it's not nice. It's just... We love it. We've been, they've been living with us for centuries in Caledonia, you know. Why they come up with that kind of stuff, I don't know. Strength and determination. I have to go to work. So do I. Small Why isn't she owner. ready for you? It's good for you. You're our hero. You know, if the government freezed your assets, you guys would f***ing run and hide. We'll see about that, Mr. Because that's what you do to terrorists, you freeze their assets. Know your history, buddy. That's all I ask. I don't care if you got a land claim over there. Terrorists. I didn't threaten you. Do it. All I did was call you up. Look, this guy here. This one. What did you say? I bet you I need a lot of these native broads and new air laws and they don't have any other options. Do you? Just your daughter. Why don't you pay like everybody else? It's a hand. Instead of getting paid? When is it enough? What do they want? The road Never back enough. up? Never enough. Take, take, take. Never That's enough. why we're here. The expense of the job. Never enough. Give your head a shake. Give your head a shake. Give your head a shake. How you word is perfect. You're an American. You're a Yeah, you got your own. Only ours. Dio just to say lot the youngest gun in Kahaga on Novali Wagani de Loda. That's who I am. And you used your profession was? Uh, federal and provincial court justice of the peace. Justice of the peace. Mm -hmm. And I was really surprised to see you here. Well, I'm here to see what's happening. <laughs> <laughs> and I um, was at the meeting last week when the Haudenosaunee and the elected council and the federal government, provincial government, and the, the builders and the OPP. Mm -hmm. I, I chaired the, the two-day meeting for them. Oh, yeah. And how did that, how did you think that went? Well, it got them talking. I think the OPPs, the province, the, fed, the feds, I don't think they really know how strongly we feel about who we are, mm -hmm. um, just because they've ignored us for 82 years now you know, uh, failed to acknowledge the Confederacy for that length of time. Just because they've done that doesn't mean we're still not here and we're still not functioning. And despite all of the other policies that have interfered with our lives, like residential school syndrome, the 60s scoop, all of that, we still know who we are. There's nothing they can say or do, no weapons that are big enough that's going to change that. And that's right from our hearts and that's something they, they can't ever take away from us. You take a look around and see all these little ones walking around here. They're learning that too. Mm -hmm. And I just like to commend each and every person that that's here <laughs> on showing the world how strong we are and what we can do when we stand united. We're here with Bertha Skye. Um, she's a highly respected uh, elder woman in our community. And you, you've been down there helping. In what way have you been <clears throat> helping? Well, making pots of soup and stew and bread. I go sit with them at the campfire, you know. And, and what do they talk about at the campfire? Um, oh, different uh, 
roles the um, people play, whether it's the chiefs, the hereditary chiefs, or clan mothers, the safety of the people. What if the police come in? What do we do if we're pepper sprayed? What do we do? That's why they had the handkerchiefs over their face or their nose. That was the reason why they had those on. While Canada sees images of men and, and the media tend to focus on the men, they paid little attention to the fact that it was women um, that were initiating it, lobbying the Confederacy for support, uh, pursuing the clan mothers and the authority of the clan mothers for support. And so they were doing much more than just reclaiming a, a, a piece of land. They were really reinstituting the Haudenosaunee government as the appropriate government to deal with. And it's the first time that the Confederacy had been at the table with the federal government in a political arena for over 80 years. And if you really look closely at almost all land struggles, whether it be um, the Lubicon or the Innu, any of these issues, while the media tends to construct it as a, a male warrior type force, it's far from reality. It's when the women decide that they're going to defend what little tiny piece of land we have left and they lobby the community for support. When the women starts to get nervous about something, then that's when the men should start to get up and act and take care of whatever's happening. And so we need more of that kind of understanding to come to our people again. And so I give um, the men an example. I say to them, when you watch the sun come out in the east every morning, you expect that to happen every morning. And you know that our old brother son, he always fulfills his duty to do that. So as he rises in the east, he's trying to deliver the light to all living things. With his light, he's kind of like a protector. And so I say to the men, that's your role, is you're a protector. That's why you were given the extra strength to be able to suffer. Sometimes in order to protect your family, also your responsibility to build a shelter, to shelter your family and keep them from all harm. And you use the sun as your example and he's real steady. Every day, he fulfills his responsibility. Seems the, our parents' generation, you know, they're, they're stuck in the mindset that they can't do anything. Their, their hands are tied. They're helpless. And we as youth are like, no, we can, we can do something and it's not too late. We felt the need to carry on with the Unity Ride and Run that came to Six Nations. Spirit of the Youth start organizing at the end of uh, the Elder Summit, uh, beginning of 2005. Having the run and going to all the different Haudenosaunee communities is uh, reconnecting our people and trying to take down the imaginary borders that separate our people. They're going to take something to the world and say, you know, this is 2004. Why are people still treating us the way they are? Why aren't they honoring our treaties? And we're on a healing journey. And those young people that ran uh, during the last couple of weeks, they really helped me because I was out of touch with certain people within the Confederacy. I couldn't communicate with them anymore. And so in that part, they helped me to heal. And I was able to talk to people again. And I, I created the atmosphere to do that. And it was acceptable, it just came naturally. And so it really, for me, it really felt good in, inside. And so now I've, I feel like we're a 
we're a whole family again and we can work again. The spirit of the youth is really led by women and young women who are also planning to go to the United Nations. So I think that um, the prayers and the spiritual component of the Unity Ride and Run have a lot to do with the fact that our women are moving forward very quickly. I want to help my people. I want to heal. I want us to heal as a collective and to become strong again in our mind and body, spirit, so that we can uh, continue on this world and be Yongwehongwe people, true Yongwehongwe people. Oh my mother, I'm so sorry for the pain that you've been through But now that I'm older and I am wiser, I'm gonna take good care of you I'm so sorry for the times that I did not show respect and I allowed myself and others to put our problems upon your back. Yo ha yo we are here. 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 When I see a starlit night, I seek the one that shines real bright. Then I think about you, mother, and I hope you're all right. I finally opened up my eyes, and I've come to realize I appreciate your guidance, and I'm glad you're in my life. Yo ha yo ho. We are here. Yo ha yo. so sorry for the pain that you've been through but now that we're older and we are wiser we're gonna take good care of you we're so sorry for the times that we did not show respect and we allowed ourselves and others to put our garbage on our turtles back Yo ha yo, we 